Good morning. Glad you brave the uh, streets in the rain and joining us today. Once you uh, find someone you haven't had a chance to say hi to and tell them hi. Give us your heart, 
Good morning, everybody. <laughs> we will begin building a dock in the back. Man, oh man, I am so glad to see you guys here this morning. Welcome to Carpenter's Way. We even have some visitors, and we're glad you're here. But we got a bunch of people watching on the internet today, you big babies. <laughs> it's just a little rain. <laughs> Unless it's in your living room, and then I guess it's okay. But uh, what a crazy, crazy week. And uh, it's uh, fixing to get a little bit crazier for us here in East Texas. So. We're glad you're here this morning. We're going to be in uh, Revelation 3 today as we study, continue our study through the seven letters that Jesus wrote to churches uh, through the Apostle John, and we're looking forward to that this morning. Philadelphia is such an encouraging letter, so uh, if, you, if you're visiting with us this morning, grab your Bible and you can join us there in a few moments. We are glad you're here, but I do have a few things that I want to highlight for our church family and, and uh, some, some announcements, especially with the uh, weather this week. Let me, let me begin by some old business. We are in the middle of nominating church officers right now, and in your worship, guys, there is an insert uh, each year at this time in preparation for our annual business meeting that takes place in November. Uh, the, uh, we ask our membership to nominate elders and deacons, and that information is in there, and it starts this week. So if you know somebody who's a member who qualify, qualifications are in their scripture, so please take some time, pray through that, take advantage of that as well. Um, if you, uh, I want to also highlight that in the middle of your worship guide, if you open it, there's some Bible studies and things coming up. Ladies' Bible study is going to begin, and uh, we need to know how many books to order. So Julie's asked me to mention to you uh, that if you're interested in participating, all that information is in there. Take some time to read it, and you can sign up in the Welcome Center so we can order books and all that stuff, ladies. So that Bible study will sh start. Uh, there's also some mission sharing times coming up, a family dedication, also a church membership class if you're interested in that. So uh, please uh, take, take some time to review that. A um, couple things now. Because of the weather this week, uh, I, we don't know what this week's going to hold. We do know that at this point, it looks like the uh, we're going to have the storm right over us about Wednesday or Thursday. So we may or may not have Wednesday night Bible study. 
Um, if it's uh, if it looks like we're going to, you'll have to swim here to church. We'll just cancel that. So um, if you a couple, this is a good time for me to remind you. The best way for us to be in touch with each other is we have a Carpenter's Way Facebook page. You need to like that. It's not private, but like it. Then you get all those announcements. Uh, another thing is if you have not downloaded the Carpenter's Way digital campus app, you can do that. And uh, that's a great way to get information from us. Uh, so it's both in, uh, you can get it on uh, an iPhone, uh, an iOS, or you can get it on uh, the other, all the formats have it. So take some time to do that. Um, or you can even watch online live as we live stream. And also, please uh, please uh, do that if you haven't, again, Facebook and also the app, and that's a way we communicate with you. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is, as you know, uh, Houston is, Houston's in bad shape, and we're going to pray for them in a moment. Uh, they've had over 30 inches of rain already in certain parts of the city. Uh, I mean, you know how much rain that is, and uh, it's a big New Orleans. A lot of, uh, of Houston is actually underneath uh, where the water table is. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough thing down there, and we need to be praying for our first responders and folks. I mean, when you have your news people telling you, don't go into your attic, sit on top of your roof, it's just, it's just crazy. And it's just starting. So a couple of reasons why, not just for us to pray this morning, which we'll do, but I also want to uh, let you know that we, um, we help oversee as a church the Red Cross sheltering that takes place in Angelina County if it happens. And uh, at this point, I haven't gotten a heads up that we're going to be sheltering in Lubkin. I think maybe they're trying to hold out in case Lubkin needs it. Uh, but uh, I know that they're opening one in Nacogdoches today for people to drop in from Houston. Um, but I, I just ask you to keep, keep on that Facebook page, on the Carpenter's Way Facebook page. We'll let you know because what will happen is uh, we will open. What we, don't really sh we don't shelter here anymore. What we do is we host the Red Cross's center for the area. Uh, during emer emergencies, and so uh, we will set up an emergency o uh, operations center here, and uh, we'll need help uh, making calls and making sure that the everything's taken care of in those shelters. So we're changing this year into that, and if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, we'll let you know when we need you, when they let me know. Uh, they said they'd give us about a 12-hour notice. Um, there's not much setting up on it. We'll take care of that, but again, please please like our Facebook page. Um, and uh, that'll, that'll give you the information you need. But that may happen this week. Uh, they're saying that this could be the worst flooding storm incident that the state has ever had in its history. So it's pretty intense. And uh, um, so anyway, uh, and another thing, Carpenter's Way family, if you get in a situation where you need help, please let us know. Um, we're a family, and we're here to take care of each other. Um, that does not mean we will come sweep your porch, although Jeff might. <laughs> But, uh, but if you get in a situation where you're in a, in a tough spot and you need some help, you let us know and we'll, we, will, uh, we will come and love on you and do what we can to help. That's what we do as a family, so uh, please take note of that. But uh, that's pretty much all I've got. That's, that's all they're telling me at this point. So uh, we're here to serve, right? And uh, this might be an opportunity for us to do that this week. If, uh, if you would prefer to work in a shelter uh, and not just at an operations center, uh, I'd encourage you to, uh, you can actually at 1 o'clock today at the Expo Center in Nacogdoches, you drive up there, um, and uh, they'll be having training for the shelter up there. You can volunteer sometimes, and then you can move back here if, if it opens. But if you want to work in a shelter, uh, you can do that too. Go to the redcross.org site that says volunteer here and sign up, and they will put you, uh, they will put you to work here. So uh, that's all I got from that. Uh, we're going to keep going in our word and our worship. That's what we came here for today. I am going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time to prepare for our offering. And, a, and with that, I just want to let you know what we do with that money is we support with the Southern Baptist Convention about 8,000 missionaries international. Uh, not only that, but Carpenter's Way supports uh, 14 local and individuals as well that we participate with in missions and we pay our bills. That's what our offering goes for. Having said that, if this is not your church home, we ask you not to give. This is for those of us who attend here regularly. Uh, we're just glad you're here, and we hope you're encouraged. And if you're visiting with us today, and uh, the message doesn't completely freak you out, uh, I would love to meet you after the service and shake your hand. And uh, I will, uh, I'll be up here for a few minutes praying with folks, and then about five minutes later, I'll go back to that table. If you go out to the right, I'd love to meet you out there. Julie will be there, and we'll shake your hand and answer questions. But we're, we're so glad you're here today. Having said that, we want you to like us, but we really want you to fall in love with Jesus. Uh, he is better than you could possibly imagine. 
And our hope and our prayer is that you find your hope in him. So let's commit our time to the Lord. Let's pray for our friends and family in Dallas or in Houston and across the state. Lord Jesus, um, you, are the great, uh, you are the great physician. You are the creator of the earth. You are the one we not only call dad and savior, but you are God, the sovereign one. And Lord Jesus, uh, there are folks right now that are, in, in, that are terrified. Uh, some are members of our family and friends. On the coast, we pray that you would be with them. Father, we pray that you would be with the first responders whose responsibility it is to go in and save people. And Lord Jesus, I pray for courage and strength. I thank you, Father, for those that you have put in positions of authority in the government. We pray that their decisions would be clear and wise. Father, I pray for a miracle today. We pray that you would just destroy the storm, that it would just go away and we could start drying out. But, Father, we thank you that you are the anchor in a storm, that you are a mighty fortress, a firm foundation upon which we can find confidence and hope. And if this storm, it is in your wisdom that you decide to allow this storm to continue, make us available, not just uh, not just because we have to, but because we want to. I pray that we would get to know our neighbors and we would care about them and through that opportunities to minister. I pray this morning as we focus on you that you would you would meet with us and you would, you would help us to see you and experience your hope and your grace. We love you. We're thankful that you love us. Meet with us today. And, and uh, Lord, thank you for allowing us to have this wonderfully air-conditioned and safe dry room. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Here in your love, here in your love.
There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place. There's no place. There's no place.
There's nothing worth more than you never come close. Nothing can compare what I live in your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord This Holy Spirit, you are welcome this place to the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts want to be overcome by your presence your presence Nothing worth more I never come close Nothing can compare No love is anymore Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Cause I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love well, my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. As Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come back this place and
If you'd take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 3. I'm going to start our time together this morning by actually just reading the letter that Jesus wrote. Write this letter, verse 7, to the angel, or as we've been talking in recent weeks, uh, it should probably, uh, it's more an accurate translation, is messenger. Uh, it can mean angel. It can also mean pastor. Uh, write this letter, I, and for reasons I've already expressed in the past, I believe this is best interpreted as to the pastor. Write this letter to the pastor of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say that they're Jews but are not, I will force them to come and bow at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to the world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be my citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone who hears, has ears to hear, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Let's uh, pray together. Father, this morning we ask you to uh, take the things of the earth as we look at you and make them grow strangely dim. And it is my prayer this morning, Lord, that we would be encouraged and lifted up by your Holy Spirit that resides in your children. For those who do not know you today, Father, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. I pray, Father, for those that are in this room and those that are watching on the internet, so that today would be a day of transformation from the inside out. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. True spiritual refreshment or comfort in the storms of life. <laughs> I just added that this morning. You're going to have to laugh better than that. You guys, I can tell that you had to swim your way to church this morning. Uh, true spiritual refreshment doesn't come from debates over doctrine or, or leadership meetings where directive church decisions are made or reached. Uh, they're not, they're not uh, made when we, when we get together and pat each other on the back, but true spiritual refreshment takes place in the quiet moments with our daddy in heaven. And I'd like to say that he intended them that way. He not only loves it when we sing loudly songs of praise, but he also loves it when we cry out to him from a position of weakness and desperation. When we sit quietly before him, begging and longing to hear his voice in the midst of a trial, where we're reminded by absolute necessity and desperation that our only hope, our only strength is actually in him alone. Remember Jesus' words from Matthew 11, 28 and 29? Jesus said, come to me, all of you, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Here is the truth from my personal experience. Although things feel terrible during a trial in which I've been, whether it's family or circumstances or money, although I hate those experiences, the truth is, as I look back on my life, I find that those are actually the most sweet times of, of the presence of God of all the seasons of my life. When I'm going through them, they seem terrifying, but God knows a secret that we've laughed about together, and that is God knows, too, that if everything's good, we, don't have, we have a tendency not to talk to him very much. We talk about him, we proclaim things, we sing songs, we listen to music, but man, when we are in desperate need of healing, when we are in desperate need of help, we are so close to him because we wouldn't dare offend him. He knows we need him, and we know we need him. And when you look back on moments in your life of that, or at least I do, those are precious. Those are precious times. The Church of Philadelphia that we're looking at this morning is, is an obedient, she's faithful, and she's extremely tired. Located on the main road of the Imperial Post from Rome to the east, this, this city was known as the Gateway to the East 
with so many people traveling through this city from so many parts of the world, it should come as no surprise that in this town you could find any religion of any flavor and pockets of culture that you wanted and like, any flesh-feeding desire you wanted in the name of God you could find in that town. This city offered a religion and culture for any taste. The ancient city of Philadelphia had a major geological problem, though. She lied directly over a fault line. And three times in her history, this city was absolutely leveled by earthquakes. Interesting side note. It is uh, reported that this church still exists to this day and is faithful to the truth of the gospel. Just an observation about this letter before we jump into each verse by verse. In seven letters that we're studying, and in all the letters that we've looked at so far, most of them uh, have a strong exhortation or teaching or instruction. Most of them contain the word repent, but two of them do not, and this is one of them. This is a letter that was to be written from Jesus to them as encouragement, and I hope it's wonderfully encouraging to you this morning as well. Revelation 3, 7, it begins with, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. Once again, as we've been studying these letters together, I hope you've come to really internalize the fact that when Jesus writes these letters, how he introduces himself to the folks in the family actually is significant to the letter. It tells them two things. Number one, I know exactly what's going on in your world. Each of the self-introductions that Jesus gives in these letters lets them know that he is personally aware of their their circumcision. (laughs) That that was a mistake. Oh, you laugh at that one. (laughs) He, He was personally aware of their circumstances, their culture, the difficulties they're having, their faithfulness or lack of faithfulness. Jesus knows. And that's how he started this whole thing. Walking among the lampstands, looking and observing, having in his hands not only the stars or the pastors of the church, but having an intrinsic knowledge of what's going on. And this letter is no exception as he identifies himself as the Holy One, the true one. Now again, I want to remind you that the scriptures are not all written to you, but they are written for you. In other words, it's our job to look on and and every verse doesn't apply to us, but I'll tell you what, every verse teaches us something about the character of God. And he introduces himself to, the, uh, to them as the Holy One or the True One. This has got to be one of the clearest self-declarations of Jesus Christ that he's God anywhere in the Bible. Because that's what he's saying by saying, I'm the Holy One. Here in the city known as the Gateway to the East, where there have, have been hundreds of temples and thousands of options in, in your religious taste to choose the God you desire and the religion you want, allowing you to feed your flesh any way you want, Jesus Christ refers to himself as holy or set apart. You know, the word holy has gotten one English translation, and that means perfect. That's not what it means. It actually means mature, growing up, thinking clearly, but it also means set apart. In fact, the word sanctuary, set apart, is the same word, the root word, from which we get holy. It's set apart for a person, a purpose. And God is saying, I am set apart. I am different than any other God you've ever heard of. All those made up gods of stone and wood, I'm not like them. I'm not even like how they present these gods. I'm different. Not only is he holy or set apart or different, I'm the one that's true. Stop for a second. I know we live in a time where it's not appropriate to say our religion is the best, So let me say it. Jesus says, I'm different than all those other religions in in your city. I'm the only real one. And I want to say that not only is Jehovah God the only one who can save anyone, he's the only God who wants to. And that doesn't even get into the fact that he's the only real God. And I know we live in a time where we're trying to find this neutral religious ground But that does not help people's souls. The truth is that our God is holy. He's different. How is he different? Because he's true. If you make something out of gold, and it's pretty, and you worship it, and you put rice in front of it, it doesn't make it alive. But this God, the God of the the Church of Philadelphia, our daddy, he writes letters to us. And he begins those letters not with, knock it off, He begins those letters with, hey, I know what's going on in your life. 
I know you personally. I am fully aware of everything going on around you. You see, our God has introduced himself to each of these churches personally. He's not some distant God. He's not the God of, our, of most of our founding fathers, my friend. Most of our founding fathers believed that God was distant or separate from us, that he started everything, but he kind of stepped back. And I remind you that Thomas Jefferson wrote a Bible because he believed that, that removed Jesus Christ's sovereignty. He did not believe that Jesus was uh, actually God. So he rewrote, the, in a Jeffersonian Bible, he rewrote the New Testament and the Gospel stories, removing any supernatural reference to Jesus Christ. That makes him, by definition, an antichrist. You may like Thomas Jefferson, you may appreciate that most of the references to God in Washington are written by him, but it doesn't make him saved. You see, our God, the God of the Scriptures, the God of Philadelphia that's writing a letter, giving it to John on the island of Patmos to give to the pastor to read to the flock, he's a God who wants them to hear from him. He's personal. This has always been about a relationship. It's not about you submitting. It's not about you getting in line. It's not about morality. It's about a God who loves people so much, he saves immoral people. If you are here this morning or watching on the internet and you are not saved, let me begin by saying this. God's design for your life is not to make you moral. It's to make you his son or daughter. The rest of it, the transformation takes place after that. And too often in the church, we keep telling you to stop your sin. I'm here to tell you, take your eyes off yourself and meet the Savior from your sin. He will change you. And family, I want to remind you that the God that you worship is not a distant God. He's personally acquainted with your life and your concerns and your issues. He knows where you are, and he even understands why you are where you are. And most of us don't have a clue. Most of us wake up once a week, well, if you're over 40, and you get out of bed and you can't figure out why your ankle hurts. Most of us can't figure out why we feel blah or depressed or sad or anxious. We can attribute it to things. Well, I'm here to tell you that the creator of your body and the creator of your emotions knows exactly why you feel that. And if you're smart, you'll run to your maker. If my car breaks down, my Toyota, I am not taking it to McDonald's to get it fixed. But too often we do that as humans. And he wants them to know, I'm involved. And let me tell you, I'm just not like the other gods. I'm different. I'm different than them. I am set apart. I am unique. Why? Because they're made of wood and stone and I'm alive. I'm, a, I'm the true God. He goes on to say that this is the message, verse, verse 7 again, from the holy and the true, the one who holds the keys of David. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, it tells us, uh, and I read some verses last week, I want to read you some more this week, because I think we forget who it is that we sang to this morning. You know, we are so traditional and we're so comfortable that sometimes when we worship together, we forget what we're doing. Songs are just prayers to God. Sometimes they're psalms affirming his character, like hymns, the great hymns of the faith. Sometimes they're songs of pleading, many of the choruses are that, God change me, hear me. They're declaring back things that we're learning about him, about his mercy and his grace. We're singing to each other. We're singing to God to let, to let all the principles and authorities know who our God is. But I still think that sometimes we forget his power and his authority. And Hebrews chapter 1 says this, Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. But now in these final days he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, the, the Son is Jesus, the author of these letters. Through the Son, He made the universe and everything in it. So now you know who the one is in Genesis 1 who created everything with the Word. It was Jesus. The Son reflects God's own glory. And everything about Him represents God exactly. That's a declaration that Jesus is God. He sustains the universe by a mighty power of His command. He oversees creation. After he died to cleanse us from the stain of sin, he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God of heaven. Last week we looked together at another part of Hebrews 1 where God the Father actually prayed to God the Son and called him his God. Your throne, O God, exists forever, we talked about last week. Jesus introduces himself to this, this spiritual family in Philadelphia by telling them that he could not even be compared to the handcrafted gods that surrounded them, for he's true and he's holy. He's different than even their man-made religions make their gods out to be. And he went on to say that he holds the key of David. 
In Isaiah 22, Eliakim was referred to as having the key of David. This gave him complete access to the wealth of Israel and David's throne with all of its authority. We believe from the reference to those within Philadelphia who claim to be Jews but are liars, and this reference to holding the key of David, that the church in Philadelphia of ancient times was a church that was at a community that was dominated by Jews. Because he's making references to things that only the Jews would have understood. And by saying that he holds the key of David, he is saying to the Jews, I'm the king of kings. Even to this day, the Jews long to have, have Jehovah sit on the, king, uh, on the king's throne. They want to rule the world, and that's a reference to them. And he's saying, I am the one to the throne. I am the one who holds the keys of the throne. I rule all things. And whether Jew or Gentile, we, the children of God, often forget just how authoritative Jesus Christ is. It is not unreasonable <clears throat> for God's kids to pray that that storm disappear. It is not unreasonable that you pray for healing. It is not unreasonable that you pray that God blesses your children. It is also not unreasonable to believe that God says no at times. Maybe much of the time. Because God knows what's best. Our God is different. The God of Philadelphia was different. While a God who's made of wood and stone sits somewhere with a bowl of rice and two candles, and unless animals eat the rice or someone steals the rice, the rice remains. Our God interacts. He talks with us. He walks with us. And I'm here to tell you, family, he wants to walk with you now. If you are running from God, I want you to know he's chasing you faster than you can run. You might as well stop. He loves you. We sang it this morning. He cherishes you. From throughout God's word, we learn of Jesus' authority. In Revelation 21, 6, it tells us that God is above all things and before all things. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is immortal and present everywhere. He's not limited to that painting on the wall. That probably doesn't even reflect him well. That's just an image that we had a guy paint here one Sunday morning during worship, and that is the image that the world has of Jesus. But we don't even know if he looked like that. In fact, I mentioned last week there's going to be a lot of disappointed Christian white supremacists when they get to heaven and find out his skin is probably dark. Some of you don't even believe that, and I'm here to tell you that you've never really looked at where he grew up. Men and women, he is himself. He's not as we create him. God is God. In Colossians 1.16, it tells us that God created all things, and, and Jesus holds all things together, both in heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible. Romans 11.33 says that God knows all things, past, present, and future. There's no limit to his knowledge. For God knows everything completely, even before it happens. Jeremiah 32, 17 teaches us that because God made everything, he can do all things and accomplish all things. Nothing is too difficult for him. And my very legalistic friends that are Baptists, those of you who are still struggling with the alcohol thing, when Jesus turned water into wine, it was wine. Water to wine. And I've told you before that one of the pushbacks I get on that whole thing is, well, there wasn't enough time for it to ferment. That is the dumbest thing I ever heard. He turned water into wine. There wasn't enough time for that either. It didn't have to take time to ferment. He's the creator of the universe. He brings the dead back to life. He makes the leg that never was usable walk. Maybe he doesn't do it for you, but he does it all over the world, and he's done it throughout the history of time, and we have limited it to him to what we understand and what we want him to be because we're comfortable with that. We, in effect, have taken a living God and recreated him in the image that makes us comfortable, and I am here to tell you that he doesn't live within social standards. He doesn't, accept, he doesn't need culture to say he's good. He doesn't even need Planned Parenthood to understand him. I'm here to tell you that no matter what Bill Nye, the science guy, says, God is not in heaven going, he doesn't believe in me. He's still the creator. And Bill Nye, the crazy guy, can't change that fact. Amen. He can scream about it, he can sue people, he can turn upside down and even drown himself in water. But God is still God. No matter what our experience is, we have lived in a time where we define God by our experiences. And I am here to tell you that he transcends our experiences. And what the craziest thing of this is, the people of Philadelphia and the people in East Texas and those of you who are the children of God, you are the children of that God. He says, call me daddy. He says, call me Abba. Cry out to me because I am intricately involved and I want to be involved in your life. Well, how come you don't do things the way I want you to? Because I'm the daddy. When your kid was five, 
and wanted something to eat an hour before dinner? Did you say yes just because you're the daddy? When your kid wanted to stick their hand in the fire at seven years old because it looked fun and orange, does it make you mean because you say no? You see the big picture, and so does he. So does he. We forget who it is that we pray to. In Psalm 103, 19, look at this verse. I love this verse. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there, he rules over most things. Everything. So explain Houston and the storms. I can't and I don't need to. All I know is the Lord has made the heavens his throne and from there he rules over everything. Everything. Well, I don't like what he's done with my life. Then walk away. That's what he said to Peter. Remember, Peter was, wonder, uh, Peter was frustrated because the crowds were leaving. And Jesus said, are you going to go with them? Well, no. Why are you staying, Peter? Why do you follow me? Well, where else can we find eternal life? The Holy Spirit has taught you that, Peter. The Holy Spirit has taught you that. Cling to his garment like the woman with the issue of blood in the gospel. Hold on to him with every piece of energy you have. Let him drag you through the streets of Jerusalem if he must, but hold on to him. He is your only hope. He's your only hope. We could spend the rest of our time looking throughout Scripture at the power and authority of our God and Jesus, but in Revelation chapter 3, 7, it pretty much sums up what Jesus wanted his kids in Philadelphia to understand. This is the message from the one who is holy, the one who's true, and the one who has the key of David. And why does it matter? He answers in the very next line. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. You see both sides of that spectrum there. I want you to think about it. Sometimes he closes doors. Even the doors of his children that that look like the right door to open. And what he closes, we can't open no matter how big our pry bar is. But what he opens, no one can close. Verse 8, I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. He doubles down on that. I've opened a door for you. God is saying to these people, look, I know you're under pressure, and I know you're obedient, and you're faithful, and you're tired. We're going to get there in a second. But what he is saying before he even gets there is, is I want to be clear here. I'm alive. I know what's going on. I I am all authority. I'm different than these other gods. And I'm telling you that I'm the one who's opened doors. And they, all of those people that are tiring you out, they can't close those doors. I hope that our study of the scriptures and the stories of the heroes within... I hope that throughout our time together, one thing is abundantly clear, and that is these men and women recorded for us in God's word had no idea what the next hour would bring, just like you. You know, we look back and we study the scriptures and we kind of look from beginning to end like Job's story. We look at Job and we go, man, that was a rough period of his life, but boy, he got everything back tenfold, remember? We kind of look at the end and, and we think it worked out okay. But you realize that when Job's kids died and his crops burned and his servants were all killed, That was just one moment in a day of his life. He didn't know how this would end. It looked like God has turned his back. And then his wife tells him to commit suicide, and his three best friends start questioning his spirituality. That was real stuff, my friends. You know what I love about movies? I can watch the beginning and the end. It's two hours, and I see how it ends happy. The problem is, and we were talking about this, Julie and I and Annie were watching a movie last week, a a true story, and as we watched it, you realize that during that event, you know, it's a two-hour movie and it ends happy and you feel good about it, but you realize that that was a long period of time in these people's lives when they go through very difficult things. It's the same in the scriptures. When you read a story that's 15 verses long, you have a tendency to look at the end and skip the middle. This was tough stuff. These people are tired for a reason. And he goes into the reasons here. He says, I know all the things that you do, verse 8. That's pretty cool. Once again, God wants them to know that he knows what's going on in and around them. I know all the things you do, and I've opened doors for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. God had opened doors of ministry for them. I'm not exactly sure that they knew that God had opened doors of ministry for them, just like you don't. We had dinner with a couple from our church this weekend and we were talking about ministry. And I say ministry all the time and I'm not sure I define it enough for you. When I say your ministry, I mean your life. 
If you're a teacher, that's your ministry. If you're a mom of an out-of-control two-year-old, that's your ministry. If you're a man whose wife is out of control, that's your ministry. If you're a member of this church and the person sitting next to you you don't like, that's your ministry. If you're a, a resident in the state of Texas, the great republic of Texas, that's your ministry. Well, what isn't my ministry? Nothing. You can stop ministering when you're dead. That will be retirement. But until then, this is all our ministry. You are in ministry. Whether you're a brand new believer or you're an old believer who doesn't know much or you're an old believer who knows too much, you are in ministry, my friends. We're in ministry. That sign is, is not just clever as you exit the, the worship center or uh, the building uh, after Sundays and Wednesdays. That it says you are now entering your mission field. That's your mission field. This week, this week we may have opportunities, all of us will have opportunities to be encouragement to people who are scared because of what's going on in Houston. That's ministry. Oh, it's not ministry. Yes, it is. It's ministry. God opens doors through tragedy, through relationships, through work, ministry opportunities. And God had opened doors for them, and they were tired. Some of them <clears throat> were dying doing it. Some were imprisoned. Others saw thousands come to Christ in the stories of Scripture, but they all followed God's lead, and most of them were not in full-time vocational ministry. Most of them were just going about their lives. A guy like Abraham, who became the father of the nation that would bless the world with, with Jesus. I mean, we, we forget that God is not calling you, and I think the church does a really lousy job at this. I think the church has a tendency to tell you, and, and I'm talking about the churches I've been involved in, from Assemblies of God to Baptist churches. We have a tendency to get you saved and then get you into ministry, and I want you, our full-time ministry, and I want you to know that most of you are not called to vocational ministry. And here's the, here's the opposite side of that. It's not because you're not strong enough. The truth is, I'm probably not strong enough to live in your world. God uses the weak and the foolish things to shame the wise. The fact is that where you're planted is your mission field. If you go to work every day and you just are making a check, you have missed the best part of your life. It's your mission field. This is my mission field. Go serve him. Go follow him. Why? Why would these men and women of the scriptures who are tired and wondering, why would they not give up? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 tells us. God had saved them by his grace when they believed, and they didn't take credit for it. It was a gift from God. Salvation wasn't a reward for good things that they had done. None of us can even boast about it. They were God's masterpiece. He created them anew in Christ Jesus so they could do the things he planned for them long ago. And so the people of Philadelphia were tired but faithful. Why? Verse 9 gives us a clue. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan, those liars who say they're Jews but are not, to come and bow at your feet. They will acknowledge you are the ones I love. Gives us a little bit of insight as to what's going on. You think God knows what's going on in Philadelphia? Apparently this was a Jewish community with Jews that were claiming to be the people of God, the children of Abraham. And they were alienating this group of believers, God's church, and they were feeling bad. It was tiring them out. They were constantly fighting. And the Lord says, don't worry, hang on. One day those people that are accusing you of a lie are actually going to bow at your feet. Side note, we've learned over the past few months, and we've been talking about the scriptures a lot, that the real author of every book in this book is Jesus Christ. The real author. It's not Moses for the first five books of the Old Testament, and it isn't Paul for 15 books in the New Testament. It, 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 isn't, it, it, it isn't Peter in First and Second Peter. The real author is Jesus. I just want to make that clear. 2 Timothy 3 tells us that every word of this book in its original form, is the very breath of God. Kip was teaching us that Wednesday night. It's the breath of God. It's God's Word. Written through the personalities of over 44 different people over a period of 1,400 years. And I think one of the coolest proofs is when Jesus says something, and he sounds a lot like another writer. For instance, what I just read to you a second ago, uh, that they, these these liars who say they're Jews but are not will one day bow down at their feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Sounds an awful lot like 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up to honor. It's the same thing. They're talking about the same thing. Why? Because waiting can be so painfully hard. 
And if we're honest this morning, my flesh, I want honor now and later. I don't want to choose. I want to be honored. I want Washington, D.C. to say that evangelical Christians, especially in East Texas, you know, the community where the baseball players that one live is the neatest community. that This, this country is so blessed to have Lufkin. And specifically the evangelical churches of Lufkin. I'm telling you, there's this church called Carpenter's Way that we thought was selling hammers, but it's actually referring to Joseph. <laughs> I mean, it's a... It, I, and, 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 you know, you've got uh, Timber Creek, and you've got these great churches. I'll tell you what, we are so lucky to have them. We would all like that. We would all like Nancy Pelosi tomorrow to say, I just want to make a statement. Thank God for evangelical. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. But we'd like that. But that ain't the plan. It's not the plan. And unfortunately, a lot of our reaction to that not being the plan is to panic and fight. The instructions are, stay obedient. Don't change anything. What have they to do with you? It's getting worse. It's going to get a lot worse. It will be as it was in the day of Noah, when the Son of Man returns. It's going to get worse. That's why we have to walk with Jesus, not with Christianity. That's why we have to walk with him, not, not religion. That's why we can't afford to create God in our image. He's much better in who he is than we can imagine. He was better than the gods, the hundred of gods they could choose from in Philadelphia. He's telling them, I know you're tired, hang in there. Listen to the rest of 1 Peter 5, it's so good. Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and in his good time, he will honor you. Give all your worries and cares to him, for he cares about what happens to you. How cool is it to have the king of kings, the creator of the universe, God of gods, the one who spoke into existence everything that is, the one who holds together all that is, not only care about you, but want to care about what you care about. Who does that? You can't get the person across this room to care about what you care about. You know that look when you go up to a person and you're telling them about what's important to you? And I'm telling you, I told my bosses, and, I did it, and, I and you can tell by their eyes they're nodding off. Why? Because what you're saying is a waste of their time, to be honest with you. God cares. He cares. Really, really, really deeply cares. Be careful. Watch out for the attacks of the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering that you are. In kindness, God called you to his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. After you've suffered for a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power is forever and ever. Amen. How cool is that? Yes, we may be struggling now, but soon... He is going to set our feet on a firm foundation. Back to Revelation 3.10. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. The wording of that passage appears to be saying that the church of Philadelphia will be delivered from the great tribulation that's about to come upon the earth, which is uh, talked about uh, begin, uh, beginning in Re Revelation 6. For those of you, and, and I know that there are many of you who don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, that's fine. But for those of you who do, I just want to remind you that this is one of the most explicit verses concerning a pre-tribulation deliverance of the church in all of the scriptures. It's a cornerstone of that belief. He appears, and maybe there's another meaning, but he appears to be saying to this church that I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring judgment on the world, and I'm going to protect you from that. I have somebody out there going, amen, I agree with you, I would rather not go through that. But even if I do, I will not bow. I just want to say a side note. Whether you're pre, mid, post, a mil, po mil, pre mil, three mils, four mils, 22 mils. <laughs> no mil at all. He came, he died, he redeemed us, he went and sit, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is coming back for us in his time and in his way. And it's going to get nasty before then, and you're going to get tired, and we're going to get scared. And we're all going to die if he doesn't return first. 
but we will not bow. This is worth dying for. This is worth dying for in image, in pride. It's worth dying for. Stand firm. Stand firm. Really don't care this morning what you believe on the tribulation and the rapture. What I do care about is you reconfirming your commitment to God's work. And for those of you who haven't been a part of Bapt uh, Carpenter's Way, let me be clear. I'm not a Baptist. I just think they do great mission work, and that's what this church is associated with in that. We are not here about Baptist doctrine. We are here about the Word of God and His truth and knowing Him as He presents Himself in Scripture. That's what matters. Because at the end of the day, God isn't going to ask, how Baptist were you? Or how Pentecostal were you? Or how charismatic? How committed were you to the tenets of Seventh-day Adventism? <laughs> He's not going to ask you that. You're either his kid or you're not. Walk with your dad. Verse 11. I am coming soon. <laughs> Pastor, this was written about 2,000 years ago. How come he's taking so long? Peter answers that. In 1 Peter, it says that 1,000 years in here is like a day in heaven. It's only been two and a half days. And he actually tells us the reason why. Anybody remember why he's being patient? to give everybody a chance to be saved. It's worth it. Maybe your experience is going to be a negative one because of it, but God's love and his patience is enduring. So if you haven't accepted him today, will you help us go home by accepting him today? <laughs> Join our family. Join our family. I'm coming soon, he says. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. No, this is not a threat that they'll lose their salvation. This is, that's not what this is. The crown is a reward for faithfulness. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 to 15, it says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. N nobody can save themselves. The foundation of everything we do, that's what he's going to talk about, is salvation through faith in Christ alone. For no one can found... Okay, anyone who builds on that... You're doing great, Kip. I'm messing you up. Verse 12. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. So, building on it. So you've got this foundation that, you, that the Father and the Son built through the blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit seals. We are asked, in our obedience to God, to build, a, to build a building on top of that. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, jewels wood, hay, or straw. You're, you're building a spiritual house. The question is, what kind? But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value at all. If the work survives, that builder receives a reward. That's the crown. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer a great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the wall of flames. You see, this is the cool thing. And I want to go back and talk, because I know some of you are kind of wondering lately in our studies, I thought you were a grace guy. Oh, I'm a grace guy. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone. You are adopted at the moment of accepting Christ's gift into the family of God. You are his kid. You are adopted into his family. Now the question, now that you've accepted that, is whether you're going to be a good or a bad kid. That's the question. The question is whether or not you're going to be a good or bad kid. That's up to you. You can go about and destroy your life in the name of Jesus or in the name of selfishness, or you can go about living your life faithful to the Lord and allowing him to determine what the reward for that is. You see, the thing is that when you give your life to Christ, you're supposed to give your life to Christ. It's his life. We live in a culture at a time where everybody's trying to figure out who they are. For the child of God, you no longer exist. In, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul said it like this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But the life I live in this body, I live for God through the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, this is not about discovering yourself. We live in an era, an era of self-discovery. I assure you, the deeper you look, the dirtier you're going to be. There is not enough alcohol or sex or drugs to make you happy. The farther you dig, the more you're going to hate how your parents raised you. The deeper you look, the more resentment you're going to have towards your bosses. The more you're going to think that your college education was a waste of your money. The more you look at your life, the more you're going to be disappointed with your emotions and your makeup and your lack of physicality. I mean, I watch football players. 
If I become self-actualized, I assure you that I will not quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys on opening night. Why? Because that's not how I was made. And we live in a time where everybody keeps telling everybody else you can do whatever you want. The biggest lie ever taught is usually at a graduation ceremony where somebody tells you you can be anything you want. I've got news for you. You can't. Girls, you will probably never play professional football. Most of you will never be president of the United States, but I want to. This God, this community is so judgmental. I want to be president. Well, then run. Do you understand what I'm saying? God made you uniquely, you. And he opens doors based upon the DNA of your, of your body and the DNA of your soul to use you in his ways. And if you will build your foundation upon the foundation of his salvation, surrendering self to his use, looking every moment of every day for doors that he opens and ones that he closes, trusting him when he does things that disappoint you, if you will live that way, then your life have been, will have been well lived no matter how poor you are or how broken you are because it's always been all about God and it still continues to be all about him now. Of the two churches that he doesn't have any instruction for, both of them are really having a tough time. Remember Smyrna? I told you that of the three churches we had studied up to that point, that's probably the church that none of us would want to attend because they had nothing. They were meeting in a burnout field of what used to be. And the one church we'd probably attend was last week's, where it said that they had a reputation for being alive, but when the Lord looked at him, he says, but you're dead, or nearly dead. Let's be about God, my friends. Revelation 3, verse 12. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Anyone who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. If you're his child, you're his property. And he writes his name on his property. He has sealed you at the moment of salvation through the sealing of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, according to Ephesians chapter 1, of the inheritance that you will receive. He owns you. You are his property. The question is, my friends, do you trust him in that? Do you trust him? He is good, but truthfully, he's not safe. The question is, will you trust him anyway? I'm going to close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this letter. It's pretty relevant, Father. We often forget, Lord, two things. Who it is that saved us and what it is he's promised for us and what is coming for each and every person who, have, who, who is on this earth right now who are the children of God, what is coming in less than 100 years for all of us is going to make this life look like a small historical shadow land. And I pray, Father, that you would take our vision off of, off of our momentary experience and put it on you, Father, and what you have promised us. May we live trying to drag as many people with us that we can. Father, may we be about your truth and your word and may we trust you when we feel scared and alone and tired. I thank you for Philadelphia and the men and women who are faithful in that church. I thank you for them now as they still worship. We pray that you would bless that body of believers, that you would bless that community, that your light and truth would shine out from them. They are living in a culture that says that Christianity should be outlawed. They're living among people who would like to kill them for their faith because they're not of the same faith. And we pray, Father, that they would be committed to you. And I pray for Carpenter's Way, Father. I pray for the men and women who are family in this church that we would be more committed to your truth than Bible Belt truth, than Baptist truth, than, than uh, historical traditional truth. I pray that we would be committed to you through your word, that we would walk with you personally and know you personally. And for those that are tired, I pray you'd encourage them today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
If uh, you would like to uh, pray, you're welcome to stay. I'll be up here for a few minutes if you'd like to talk. If you're visiting, I'll be with you in about five or ten minutes. I'd love to have coffee with you. Uh, if you have not become Facebook friends with Carpenter's Way, please do that. We'll keep you updated. Pray for the people in Houston. Offer yourselves. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.